Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. I'm going to start today with an excerpt from Save by a Poem by Kim Rosen. A poem is a physical event. The rhythm may quicken or slow your pace. The flow of the language may expand your breathing. The music woven into the words may change the very texture of your voice. A poem even entrains your wavelengths, altering your biochemistry and allowing shifts in consciousness that can bring healing, understanding, and unexpected insight. Spending time with a poem is a way of choosing what you're doing with your attention. In this world of iPods, emails, cell phones, and spam, opportunities for fragmentation of consciousness are thick and fast. It can be life-saving to return to the sanctuary of a poem that you hold within you. Like singing a song you love or blasting it on the stereo. Like reading a favorite psalm or your heart sutra several times a day. It is a choice to fill your thoughts with what you hold precious and believe in, instead of the plethora of commercial jingles, self-criticisms, or anxieties about the past and the future that usually overrun the mind. When I focus on a poem I love, my thoughts stop spinning and become quiet. My body relaxes. My breathing finds the rhythm of the poem. Whether I'm in a car, on the subway, walking on the beach, or sitting on a meditation cushion, that poem becomes as real a refuge as any church, synagogue, or mosque. To develop a relationship with a poem is something like falling in love, with all the wonder and challenge that can bring. It begins with infatuation, the curiosity to get to know the poem, to learn everything you can about its meaning, rhythm, sound, and silence. At the same time, you are allowing the poem to carry you into yourself, evoking feelings, reflections, and new experiences of the world. Then, as with any relationship, inevitable difficulties arise and the hard work comes. Suddenly you find you don't like the last stanza after all, or you repeatedly stumble over the third line, or a certain turn of phrase inexplicably brings up a sense of discomfort you'd rather avoid. But you hang in there anyway, allowing the poem to take you beyond your comfort zone. A new and enriching experience invariably awaits behind every resistance. Ultimately, there is the pleasure and grace that comes when the poem has become you, or the poem becomes yours. You know it intimately and can share it with others or simply read it to yourself for your own pleasure. The spoken poem is a wondrous new creation born of the unique convergence between words that have been written for someone by someone else even someone who may have lived centuries ago in a faraway country, and your own voice. Once you know a poem deeply, you have a gift you can give others as well as yourself. There are those who might need to hear this poem at crucial moments in their lives, as only you can speak it. I have that experience almost every day, when my neighbor, who had never before liked poetry, lost her daughter in a car accident, She asked me if I knew of a poem that might help her. I read to her from Rilke's first elegy. When I got to the first stanza, which speaks of how grief for the death of the child can become the source of our spirit's growth and pierce through barren numbness, she started to sob. She tried to stifle her tears at first, but as I read on, wave after wave surged through her. Later, when the flood of grief had subsided, she told me she'd been unable to cry for her daughter until her own numbness was pierced by the poem. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. 
Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Psalm 18, 28 through 34, the New Living Translation, with thoughts by Eugene Peterson. Suddenly, God, you floodlight my life. I'm blazing with glory, God's glory. I smash the bands of marauders. I vault the highest fences. What a God. His road stretches straight and smooth. Every God direction is road tested. Everyone who runs towards him makes it. Is there any God like God? Are we not at bedrock? Is not this the God who armed me, then aimed me in the right direction? Now I run like a deer. I'm king of the mountain. He shows me how to fight. I can bend a bronze bow. The salvation of God is not simply a rescue. It is a powerful, strength-giving experience. The psalmist sings of smashing, vaulting, running, fighting, and bending bows of bronze. It's hard not to think of superheroes. Do you associate salvation with pure, unadulterated strength and power? Or are you inclined to think salvation merely makes us nicer and less sinful? Do not misunderstand. There is a power in absolute Christ-like kindness. But it's not passive, and it's certainly not a thought or a theory. The salvation of God is arming you for battle, showing you how to fight. What fight is God preparing you for? Thank God for his divine salvation, which is a truly miraculous, empowering, and strengthening force in your life. Not only has God rescued you, he has prepared you for great things. Ask him to aim you in the right direction and show you what his strength is meant for for in your life. Ask him to give the strength of salvation to others who are feeling battle-weary, and in need of illumination. Fight the battle against evil with good courage. Whether your energy today is high or low, whether the tasks ahead are simple or seemingly impossible, remember that God's salvation is a source of strength bigger and deeper and stronger than your circumstances. Here's some thoughts from Crushing, God Turns Pressure into Power by T.D. Jakes. The process of developing excellence is never microwaved, and the transformation in which God has us requires staying power. Are you willing to stay in the midst of the pain? Are you willing to sacrifice the time it takes to be your best? Will you sacrifice what is good in your life? in order to achieve the greatness latent within you? The change and transformation we're enduring is a test of time. If we continue with the master, the end result legitimizes the trauma of our pasts. If you don't bear the fruit of continuance, think about the root of your conversion. You can tell how real God's process is in your life by whether you continue with Him. After all, you can only fake your desire for transformation for so long. That's why it requires faith. Confidence in what cannot be seen by your mortal eyes and hope in the supernatural power of God to do the impossible in your life. Change is a savage business. 
and you will easily part with its end results if you forget what it cost you. Yet, with such a high price being required of us by the Master, who has an expected end for us, how can we ever forget that the wine he is producing in us is well worth it? Can we believe that the price we're paying as we water our seeds of greatness with our blood, sweat, and tears is truly worth it?